I want to jump straight into the Word. I think this is going to be a shorter message. Uh, we're, I typically preach sermons and lead worship, and, and I, I like to talk about the battle a lot. I talk about battling, we, because we as believers, we are constantly in a battle. And if you've never really felt like you're in a battle, you're doing Christianity wrong, okay? <laughs> Christianity is always a battle. You're always fighting. But today, I'm going to shift a little bit. I'm, I'm going I'm to, you know, it's going to change the temperature a little bit. And, and I want to preach um, from a very different place than where I normally am, okay? Because I believe that this morning, God wants us to, to approach this topic a little gentle, with, with, with some gentleness, some, some care. And I said this in the first service, and I want to say this again. I think that this message is, like, I'm preaching this message like it's for one family, man. I know there are quite a few people over here and people watching online. This is something that I want to be very gentle in, and I want, to, I want to approach it very gently. We're in John chapter 6, where Jesus, his popularity has grown. In six chapters, John is not really worried so much about the timeline of what happens next, and then he went and did this. Mark and Matthew and Luke, they're a little bit more cautious about timeline. John really wants to highlight who Jesus is. So he highlights some of the miracles that Jesus does, and he highlights it because he wants people who are reading it 2,000 years later to know that Jesus was more than just a good man. He was more than just a miracle worker. He was more than just a moral teacher. He was more than just a Jewish carpenter. He was God. And so John is going to highlight some of these signs. We're going to see the fourth sign that Jesus does in John chapter 6. And I'm going to walk you through the first 13 verses. So if you have your Bible, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 13 is where we're going to be. We're also going to be jumping a little bit into the book of Mark because Mark is going to give us some details in, in this passage where John omits some of the details. Nothing wrong with that. It's fine. But <clears throat> in this passage, we're going to see that there's a huge need that arises. There's a problem. And the problem is because Jesus is getting popular and there are thousands of people that are following him. Um, some scholars and historians believe about 20,000 people in this passage. While the gospel writer says 5,000 men, they estimate that with the women and the children, it's about 20,000 people. That's a huge following. With no TikTok, with no Facebook, with no YouTube, with no radio programs, with no microphone, with no cool-looking dreadlocks. <laughs> but people saw the signs and the miracles and his message, and they begin to follow him. And they want to hear, what does this man have to say? And they're going to follow him far and wide into desolate places and listen to him all day long to a point where they're, we they're weary now. They're tired. And there's a problem that arises. Isn't it funny that wherever there are people, there's problems? Yeah. Thanksgiving, around the dining table. If you don't want to have problems, don't invite anybody. Just you and your turkey and you'll, be, you'll you have a problem with yourself then, right? You're like, I need medication for that. But wherever there are people, there's going to be problems. And when there's 20,000 people, there's going to be problems on a very larger magnitude, on a larger scale. And what I want to unpack to you this morning is the way Jesus solves the problems that he creates. He creates this problem and the way he solves it. And the way he solves it is with bread. He's going to use bread to test his disciples. He's going to use bread to solve the problems. And he's going to use bread this morning to teach you and me that the blessing that he's got for you is not broken. There are three words that I want to unpack as I follow the bread in this passage. And the reason why I want to stress on I'm following the bread is because I know you would send me emails with 13 different sermons on 13 different preachers who preach this passage. And we can talk about the test of the disciples. We could talk about the storm later. We could talk about the boy's obedience. We can talk about various different things with this man because it's such a rich passage. But I want to follow the bread. Okay, so follow the breadcrumbs with me like Hansel and Gretel. All right, except we're not going to be caught by the evil witch. We're going to be embraced by a loving father. All right, so we're going to follow the bread. And the three words that I want, to, I, want, I want to focus in on is the bread that was overlooked, the bread that was broken, and the bread that was the leftovers. The overlooked, the broken, and the leftovers. The overlooked, the broken, and the leftovers. And I get goosebumps as I say this because I know sitting in this room, there are some of you who feel like you're overlooked, you're broken, and you're just a leftover. You're broken, you're overlooked, you're left over. And I want to tell you here this morning that your blessing is not broken, my friend, because the God that blesses you doesn't bless you to break you. He blesses you to build you. And if he tears down, it's to tear you down, to build you up because he's tearing down the works of the enemy. Broken, overlooked, and leftovers. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All right, on a lighter note, as a youth pastor, we used to get a lot of donations that came into the church. Funny. 
No one calls me and says, Pastor, I bought a brand new car. And the Lord told me to give you my brand new car. No, they will give me the used one, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. It's fine. It's okay. It's just that when they bring the Pentium 1 computers, I have a problem with that. It's because Goodwill didn't accept it. The thrift shop didn't want it. The yard sale, no one wanted to buy it for $2. And so it's like the church can use it. Pastor, steward it well. It'll help you write your sermons, right? <laughs> Why? As a youth pastor, we got donations of couches that had more duct tape than cushions on it. Right? They're like, the youth would love it. Like, I don't think they will, right? Does it have any money in it? Because then they might. And oftentimes we feel like the blessings that God, give, that God gives you is broken, used, abused. No one wanted it. Like, God, did you buy that from a yard sale? Don't nudge it to your wife, okay? Like, a broken blessing, Lord, right here. No, we oftentimes feel like the blessings that God's given you is the leftovers, not the choices, not the best. You read about that in the Bible, you hear about the pastors talk about it, but you don't feel like you have the blessings of God that is the best that he's chosen for you, and you feel like the blessing that you have is broken. And as I follow the bread in this passage, I want us to learn lessons from this blessing that was overlooked, this blessing that was broken, and this blessing that had leftovers, and I want to bring it in the context of your life and how there's blessings in your life that you're overlooking, blessings in your life that is being broken to be multiplied, and blessings in your life that's leftovers that God wants you to pay attention to. So let me take you from your seats into the context of this passage where you need to be sitting with these people who are crazy about the Word of God. They're hungry for the Word of God, and they follow Jesus. So John chapter 6, if you're there, we'll pick up from verse 1. Are you guys excited for this? Yeah. You should be. John chapter, one, John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. I want you to picture this. I want you to smell this. They are following. In fact, we're going to see in the book of Mark that they run along the shore because they recognize Jesus and his disciples, and they want to hear what he has to say. And Jesus takes a seat over here, and he's getting ready to teach. Now it says in verse 4, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So you know that the mind is in the right place. They're ready to listen to God's word because their hearts are being preparing for the Passover, which is one of the greatest festivals where they remember the lamb that was killed and the blood applied on the doorpost where the angel of death passed over them. The, God passed over them and there was no death in their house. And so they're getting, their heart is in the right place, their mind is in the right place, and now they're ready and posted to listen to God's word. Verse 5 says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him for he himself knew what he would do. When God tests you, it's not because he needs to know the answer. God is omniscient. He knows what you're walking through. He knows what you're thinking. He knows where your mind is. He knows what you spend your money and your time on. But when God tests you, it's for you to know what is in you. Oftentimes, we don't know what's in here. We don't know what's in here. You do not know how crazy your spouse can be until you've put her to the test. And you're like, oh, man, you know? I didn't know a white girl could punch that hard, right? No, I'm kidding. She does not punch me. God will put you to the test to shake you. He'll put you to the test to, to, to put you in some trouble for you to know where your faith lies. A pastor friend of mine who mentored me he said this once, he said, you spill what you're filled with when shaken. Ooh. And Jesus turns to Philip and he says, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? And he said this to test him because he already knew what he was going to do. Oh man, I could stop right here and just preach a whole message. Maybe this is for somebody. God knows what he's going to do while you're walking through your test. He knows what he's going to do, but he's putting you to the test to show you where your faith lies. And if you're just relying on your flesh, if you're relying on money, if you're relying on your numbers, if you're relying on your hard work, your efforts, your, you know, experience. And Philip, see what he's going to rely on. He's going to, he, man, he's a numbers guy, right? He's like, well, let me tell you how much it's going to cost to feed all these people. Let's look at Mark chapter 6 real quick before we jump back to the book of John, because Mark is going to give us some details to paint the picture of where you should be sitting here this morning. Now many saw them, that's the disciples and Jesus, and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When they went ashore, he saw a great crowd, that's Jesus, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. What a beautiful Savior you have. Listen, if you read this in its context, 
throughout the Gospels, you would see that Jesus has just gotten news about John the baptizer's death. That's his cousin. Now, Jesus was fully God and fully man. He was tired like you and I are tired. He was hungry like you and I are hungry. He wept like you and I wept. And he wants to get away with his disciples to grieve. And he goes away to a desolate place we're going to see just to be alone with his disciples. But <laughs> the people see, that's why I like how Mark writes it, they see and they recognize, and what do they do? They run along the shore to come find him. How do they recognize him? They didn't have Facebook and Instagram back then. Someone must be like, hey, that's Yeshua. Th that's the Jesus of Nazareth. And they run after him, and he has compassion. He looks at them as sheep without a shepherd. And he sits down, and he begins to teach. And look at this. And it says in verse 35, when it grew late. What does that tell you about Jesus? He preached long sermons. <laughs> and when it grew late. But you see, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes preachers preach long, but it doesn't feel long. And sometimes preachers preach for 20 minutes, and it feels like you've been there half your life, right? Doesn't happen in this church, though, does it? <laughs> I'm kidding. But when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, Pastor, we have a problem. Okay? You're not keeping your eye on the clock in the back over there. And because of that, it's going to get dark now, and these people are going to faint when they go back home. I'm paraphrasing. This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Follow the bread. Back to John chapter 6. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little bite or morsel. It's not, you're not going to... 200 denarii, that's about eight months' wages. Back to Mark chapter 6, verse 36, to put it into context. Send them away the disciples are saying, to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. And so the disciples replied and said, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Should we spend eight months worth of money to get them a little morsel? And Judas said, we have that kind of money in the bag? Where'd you hide it? I'm kidding. He didn't say that. But the problem is that people are hungry now. They were hungry for the word, and Jesus is able to give them the word. But now they are physically hungry. And sometimes we have a physical problem. And we feel like physical problems, we need to go to physical people. And that's what Philip is doing. Should we go into the town and buy bread for all these people? I don't know how quickly they can make it. I mean, they didn't have a Costco back there, right? What, what do you want us to do? Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, here we go. There's a boy here, he has five barley loaves and two fish. And I wish he stopped there. But he says, but what are they for so many? But what are they for so many? Number one, write this down, Jesus uses the overlooked blessing. You and I know the narrative of what happens. Jesus is going to take this bread, barley loaves of bread. Barley bread was used for animals. It wasn't really used for human beings. It was cheap, low <clears throat> slave food. He's going to take this bread and he's going to feed the masses. But isn't it interesting that what are they for so many? What are they for so many? There are 20,000 people. There's a boy with five loaves and two fish. What are they for so many? Weren't you there when Jesus turned water into wine? And you look at him and you say, what are they for so many? But you know what? I will have grace for him, for the disciple who says that, because you and I say that every day of our lives. You and I look at the mirror and we say, what can I do when the need is so much? We overlook the blessing of what God has entrusted you with. You know how many times, I don't know about you, but maybe this is just me. I wake up in the morning and I feel inadequate. Inadequate to be a husband, to be a father, to be a pastor, to be a preacher, even just to be a human being on the face of this earth. I feel unqualified, inexperienced. My failures come up before me. And I look at myself and I say, no wonder God just wants to overlook me. No wonder people just want to overlook me. What do I have? America, the past two years, we've seen this country go through turmoil. And you woke up in the morning and said, what can I do? I'm not smart. I don't have the eloquence. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the influence. I'm no rock star. And I thank God that when the disciple comes and says, what is this 
for so many? Jesus says, that's where I shine. In your adequacy, I will be more than adequate. That's why I shine. This blessing is not just overlooked, my friends. This blessing is also underrated. It's extremely underrated, just like how you underrate yourself. Extremely underrated. Who am I? I see the need, but, but who am I? Have you seen my past? Have you seen my rap sheet? Do you know what my dad thinks about me? Do you know what my mom thinks about me? Do you know what my brother thinks about me? To hell with what they think about you. What does God say about you? <laughs> but what are they for so many? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Now it doesn't mean that just the men sat and everybody was standing. What the gospel writers implying is we counted the men and they were 5,000 people. Isn't it interesting that they counted the men, but the one that actually had the blessing that was overlooked was not counted. <laughs> I love that God uses people who are not even counted. You know, I come up over here and I, I think I make this look easy. But I can take you back in my life at the times when I was not counted. I was overlooked. Overlooked because of my education or lack of. Overlooked because I didn't have command over my language. Overlooked because of who my dad was, my family background. Overlooked because of the way I think. And the reason why Living Church Boise, I love you and I got to share this with you is because I know that sitting here in these chairs under the sound of my voice are people who are believing the lies of the enemy saying, even the Savior overlooks me. The disciples of Jesus, the pastor might overlook you, but your Savior says, bring what's overlooked and you guys sit on and watch what I will do. He uses the overlooked blessing. I thank God for the times in my life when I was overlooked. I thank God for the times in my life when I overlooked myself because in those times, God taught me humility. Let me give you some examples from scripture. You know, David, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say David? Goliath, good. First service was like Bathsheba. <laughs> Legalistic bunch of people, right? Like, I'm like, really, Bathsheba? Well, I guess she was bigger than Goliath, right? Crazy. But... <laughs> David, Bathsheba, his repentance, his worship, King David, right? Jesus, son of David, screams Bartimaeus. Man, David is remembered thousands of years later. David, what do you know? When Saul had run, you know, turned against God and his anointing was gone as a king, Samuel now is making his way to the house of Jesse, David's father, to anoint the next king of Israel. And, and Samuel comes into Jesse's house and he sees Eliab and he says, this man truly must be the king because he looks like a king. And so he's getting ready with his oil to anoint him and God says, stop, Samuel, stop, 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 time out. You're looking at the outside, I look at the heart. And he goes to all the brothers one by one. And God says, nope, 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 nope. Watch the overlooked. Watch the overlooked man. So Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest. It's always the youngest, isn't it? How many of you guys are the youngest at home? See, you guys have been too scared to put your hands up because you're worried that you, your older brother's going to knock you and be like, put your hand down. Just go to church now, right? The youngest, man. Always got into trouble, right? It's crazy. Yeah, that's the youngest. He's tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. I'm telling you this morning that God anoints and blesses the overlooked and the underrated. And you might be overlooked, you might be underrated, but God still has a calling on your life, has a purpose in your life, and his anointing is not withheld because you are being overlooked by people. God created you for a purpose. God doesn't see the way man sees. God doesn't see the way prophet sees. God sees you in the way he knitted you together with a plan and a purpose. And your parents might have overlooked you. The country might overlook you. The president might overlook you. Your school teachers might have overlooked you. And you might have overlooked yourself. But God anoints the overlooked. He anoints the underrated. Let me give you one more example of a guy who looked at his own life and he said, underrated. And he began to overlook himself. My, one of my favorite Old Testament um, characters, whenever I feel like I'm, you know, putting myself down. His name is Gideon. You might have heard of him. 
He's, he's famous for trashing wheat in the wine press. Okay, you don't do that. But he's hiding from his enemies and he's like, you know, man, a little grain will be good for me to eat. And the angel of the Lord shows up to him in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, almighty man of valor. <laughs> Look at the way this guy is completely underrating himself. And Gideon, in verse 15, replies to the angel of the Lord. He says, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? What's he saying? What am I for so many? What am I? How can I? Me alone? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. I'm the weakest. I'm the least. I'm alone. What am I for so many? Please get this. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, I will be with you. I'm not saying that you're wrong, Gideon, but I am with you. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And if you read the book of Judges, the way God uses Gideon, in fact, God tells Gideon, you have too many people. Get rid of them. Bring them down. Thin them down. You have too, much, too many people to stand with you. I will fight for you. You will see the victory. I will be with you. I will be your God. I will be the warrior in your midst. And you don't need to fight this war with swords and bows and arrows. And I will tell you what to do. I thank God that God anoints and blesses those that are overlooked. Think about the disciples, fishermen. In the book of Acts, the religious elite are surprised. Who are these uneducated men? Where did they get such knowledge and wisdom and courage from? And then they took note that they'd been with Jesus. Oh, we looked at them as underrated, but Jesus called them, anointed them. And I'm telling you, I get goosebumps when I think about it. It makes me want to jump because so many times we listen to the lies of the enemy and we feel like, who am I? And you live your whole life thinking, who am I? What can I do? Instead of saying, God, what do you want me to do today? Which enemy do you want me to slay this morning, God, when I get up? And then we listen to all these other guys who love keeping you in your religion of fear, saying, oh, you're not David. Oh, no, you can't slay any giants. I'm like, bro, did you read the Bible where it says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me? You might think I'm underrated, but man, God thinks I'm a pretty big deal that he put me here on this earth and he's given me a calling and he's given you a calling. And this blessing that you are ignoring as underrated might not be you, it might be these other things in your life. This blessing that's underrated might be the person you sit across every day in your dining room. It might be a person who's gray-haired, and you feel like they're just taking up space right now. It might be a person who's really loud and still a child. And you feel like they're just a burden to you right now. And we begin to demean, undervalue the people that God is going to use to feed. The people who are really hungry and in need. But we can tend to underrate, overlook the blessings in your own life. And it's possible that sitting in this room that there are people who have been blessed immensely, but you just look at it as five barley loaves and two fish. What are they for so many? Before you get too excited, I need to take you to number two. Jesus uses the broken blessing. You see, as I was writing this, I was really excited because I started doing inventory in my own life. I have to. And I was like, man, that's a blessing. Wow, what a blessing. Wow, what a blessing. And then I started realizing that, whoa, I don't like the sound of the snap and the crack when God begins to break. He begins to break. He begins to break. He begins to break things around me. You know what I'm talking about? When you're enjoying this beautiful call of God, God, you called me to preach, awesome, and then it's like, ouch. I'm being broken, Lord. Hate mail. People are leaving the church because I said something, one word that they, you know, didn't think that they would hear in church, and you know, my jeans had some rips in it. And I'm like, God, I'm, 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 I've been broken. I've been broken, Lord. I've been broken. God, you told me to preach, and now I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal from. Broken, God. God, you told me to preach, but I, I don't have any way to, to pay the rent this month. Broken, Lord. My car's falling down. Broken, Lord. You told me to step on in faith. I did. And what a blessing that was that you called me. I was overlooked, but you anointed me, and now I'm stepping in. Uh, broken, Lord. I stepped on in faith, but I'm hearing cracks, snap, and... And even the little that I have, which is nothing, you tell me to give everything away, broken, Lord. But it's amazing how God uses even these times of breaking. Look at this in verse 11. 
Jesus then took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So all to the fish as much as they wanted. Look at Mark chapter 6 real quick. Because Mark gives us some extra information over here. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, this is Mark 6 verse 41. He looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. Let me pause over there real quick. This is a side note. While you appreciate the blessing that God's given you, don't stop being grateful for it. I like that Jesus takes it and he blesses it. He gives thanks for it. Oftentimes, we lose the blessing of God because you're not grateful for it. Hard work will get you what you want. Consistency will keep you there. But being grateful will multiply your blessing. On the flip side, when God blesses you and the blessing is not shaping your character, your blessing will turn into a curse. You can look at this in the life of Abraham, in the life of David. You can look through this, all the people that God blessed, people of Israel. The blessing turns into a curse because the character is not being shaped. Hard work will get you there. Consistency will keep you there, but gratitude will multiply your blessing. Okay, that's just a side note. I like that God, he takes it, and even those five barley loaves, okay, it's what a slave would eat. It's what they would give animals. It's the lowest, the cheapest food that you can find. He gives thanks to it. And then it says in the book of Mark, and he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples to set before the people and he divided the two fish among them. Pause with me real quick and look at this through the eyes of the boy. Would you please? I mean, let's, let's get the word alive in you this morning. Here's a boy. The crowd all around him, the noise, the smell, and they're all quiet because they're listening to Jesus and now everybody's hungry and it's starting to get dark and a little cold. And in 20,000 people, it's this one boy that has food. Nobody else has food. I mean, the supply demand thing over here is huge. I mean, NFT's got nothing on this. <laughs> okay, this boy's got some cash. If I was the boy, I would have done one or two things. One, I would have sold it and made a big fat buck. True story, I'm Indian, man. I can't help it, okay? <laughs> or two, I would have used it to work my way closer to Jesus. I mean, like, hey, you want some food? Can I get a picture with you? It's for Instagram, it's fine. You know, how about a TikTok video? I would have used it to my advantage. But the boy gives it to Jesus. No, I know you've heard this from Sunday school, but let it hit you in a new way. He gives it into the hands of Jesus, and then Jesus, he breaks it. He breaks it. Before we get to the multiplication, don't go too fast. He breaks it. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but that bothers me a lot when God does that in my life. When overlooked, ah, great. It's bare, barely any food, but wow, it's finally going to be used. And I'm like, here, Jesus. And he's like, hey, tread carefully. I know you're God and all, but that's food. And we're all hungry and you're breaking it. You know, the, the bread is counted while it's in the boy's hands. The bread, we know how many loaves when it's in the disciples' hands. But once it's broken, we lose count of it. So it tells me something, multiplication. When God begins to break you, it's because he's multiplying you. When God begins to break you is when your blessing actually begins to multiply. And I know you're not very excited about this right now, and I wouldn't be too, but when I look back in my own life, I actually thank God for the times when he broke me. You know, last night we were praying with my family and I actually got really irritated with my daughter because she saw my guitar and she saw how beat up it is. And all my kids think it's such a cool guitar because I play it like a monkey on crack, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh, let's go. And oh, just true, true story. And um, this, I'm actually glad I'm using this. I was using this guitar this morning because um, when I was a youth pastor, I was leading worship once and, and the strap fell and the guitar fell and, and it broke, it cracked. It was like fully open. It was like wide open over here. So it couldn't, wouldn't hold tune. And so I just left it for a couple of years. And I was like, man, I really like this guitar. And so one day I just put some weights on it, super glued, like just super glued. It's half the guitar is just super glued now, you know, and glued it back together. And, and I, I love the story of this guitar because I like that God doesn't overlook broken things. But when he breaks it, 
he actually has got a story behind it. And when he breaks it, he begins to multiply it. I look back on a lot of these scars. I thought one of my friends was going to be here this morning. We used to lead worship together when we were in youth group. And I remember those nights when we would just have such an amazing time of worship. I didn't realize how much of a beating that guitar was taking. And last night when my daughter was saying, that's so cool, I got irritated because I was like, man, I want a better guitar for me to lead worship. I lead worship every single week. I need to have a better guitar. And immediately the Spirit of God took me to the time when I was in India. And I said yes to ministry. And I got into ministry. And folks, I thought God hated me. I had to borrow guitars to lead worship. I mean, I'd be texting friends, be like, can I borrow your guitar? I need to lead worship tomorrow at my church. The church didn't have money to buy a guitar. And so I had to go borrow a guitar. I was thinking of the times when I had to hitchhike to church to get there early to sweep up. And then you remember the overhead projectors? You had to write and change my heart, oh God, make it ever true, OHP, you know? I play my acoustic borrowed guitar, rusted strings. I remember getting up and preaching with a borrowed Bible because I didn't have money to afford my own Bible. And in those times, I thought that God was breaking me. I thought God hated me. I thought God didn't want, want me in ministry. But I didn't realize that it was the breaking that God was walking me through, that was multiplying my blessing. The reason why I preach the way I preach this morning, the reason why I study the way I study this morning, the reason why I worship the way I worship this morning is because if you look back at my history, God had to break me to appreciate what I have now. God had to break me to love what I have now. And now I pick up a guitar, any old guitar, and I'm like, let's lead worship because it's not about what I play, it's who I play for. And I know I've played with many musicians who have like really expensive instruments, and they're like, what are you playing? A $150 Yamaha. They're like, wow, that sounds good. I'm like, it's not about what you play, it's who you play for. You know, man, I'm telling you, like, I love that when God, he uses my hands, it's not me, it's him. I like that when I open the word, it's not me, it's him, and he gives me the word. It's because when I look back, not too long ago, he had to break me. Why? Why just India? Just a couple of months ago, I had to tell friends to come pick me up from home to bring me away here to preach because my car blew an engine, man. <laughs> Don't you love it when that happens? And you're like, God, do you hate me? Do you try to keep me away from church? And God's like, no, I'm breaking you because I need to multiply what I've entrusted with you. And you might be walking through a breaking right now. You might be walking through a time when you're like, God, are you against me? Are you for me? Do you hate me? What did I do to get on your wrong side? And God's saying, I'm breaking you to multiply what I've entrusted you with. I'm breaking so that you really see what you're filled with. Breaking you to show what comes out of you. Breaking you, putting you in a place of need so that you will know that I am the only one who can satisfy your every need. I am the only God who provides your every need. I am the only God that's called you and you will serve me and nobody else. You will not serve comfort. You will not serve materialistic blessings. You will serve me. And all those things... If you seek first the kingdom of God, I will take care of those things. Elijah, in the Old Testament, God tells Elijah to go to a place called Zarephath. And he says, you go there and I've told a widow who will take care of you. This is the time when there's a famine in the land, there's drought in the land. And God tells Elijah, you go with there and this widow's going to take care of you. God pulls one of those teenager tricks, man. God told me to marry you things. Girls, you know what I'm talking about, right? You go to a youth camp and God's like, yeah, God told me, well, God didn't tell me. Well, God didn't tell the widow that she had to take care of the prophet, but God tells the prophet, this widow's going to take care of you. So the prophet goes, and he meets this woman, and she's gathering tricks. Look at verse 11 in, second, in 1 Kings chapter 17. And as she was going to, and he says, can you bring me a drink of water? And as she's going to bring him the water, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only, only, pay attention to only, a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. You have a hunger. What I have is not going to be sufficient. What I have is not going to be enough to feed your hunger. In other words, she's saying, what is this for such a big need? And then Elisha says, oh, she continues, and now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat it and what? And die. And now I'm gathering some sticks so that I can make a last meal, eat it, and then die. Mm. See, at this point, if Elijah was your typical American pastor, he would say, I am so sorry. Oh, I did not know you were going through such a heartache. Don't worry, we'll get a meal train going. We'll get a GoFundMe going for you. I've got a lot of followers. I'm sure that we'll figure something out. God does not do that. In fact, it seems like God puts more weight 
I mean, how do you like it when you say, God, I have nothing, and God says, give me everything then? Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you've said. He's not saying, don't go kill yourself. Go, go and do as you said, but first, seriously, Elijah? Come on, man. But first, make me a little cake and bring it to me, and afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. Hmm. I want to talk to those of you real quick about the times when God said, trust me. And he said, God, I have nothing to give you, God. I have nothing. I have no talents. I have no experience. I have no money. And God said, give me what you got. And watch I would do. Watch what I would do. And it's been 20 years and you're still not giving it to him. And he still comes every single time you get into his presence. Says, are you ready? Now are you ready? Now are you ready? Will you give me what you got? Will you give me what you got? Will you give me what you got? I remember as a 20-something-year-old sitting in my office late night working in a night shift, sitting there on my computer, and God said, when are you going to start serving me? When are you going to quit working for the world and serve me? You heard me say this multiple times before. I felt like I was going to fall off my chair. I couldn't help it. That very night, I typed up my resignation letter, printed out. It was about 2 in the morning. Went to my boss's office, said, man, I'm done. He thought I was angry with him. I said, no, no, bro, I love you. I love working here, but God, and this guy was a Hindu guy. He didn't understand it. I said, God is compelling me. I got to go serve him. He gives me a whole month paycheck. And he says, go to Bangkok and have all the fun you want, man, and come back. You're just stressed. You're a young guy. You're stressed with work. I took the paycheck, took the month off, and that month God spoke to me very clearly and said, I've called you to serve me. And I went back, and I, after a month, I said, no, man, I need to go serve God. And I thought God was calling me to YWAM or something like that because I did not know what God was calling me to do. And that guy hated me so much because I didn't want to come back and work for him. He ended up firing me, and he told all the businesses that are not to hire me. So God closed all those other doors. And then I came back home, and God said, empty out your bank account. Give away everything. Give away your car. Give away your motorcycle. Broke, 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 broke. God just broke me down. And the first year, God said, I want you to be still and know that I'm God. I will provide for you. I will take care of you. I'm not saying that's what you should go and do, but I'm saying that God at times will call you to give everything up. And I thank God for those times when he broke me. Those were the times I had to hitchhike to go to church to lead worship. I had to stop hanging out late on Saturday night so I can go serve my church on Sunday morning. Those were the times I watched God multiply my talents. Those were the times when I opened the word, I saw God's word really starting to come alive. I started to understand what God was calling me to do. It was those times when God began to break me. And there were times, I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you, there were times when I wanted to jump back in his hands and take back all that I'd given him. I wanted to go back and get a job. Why even recently, before we planted the church, God said, go plant a church. And I said, okay, I need to supplement my income somehow. So I went and got a job and I felt like a prostitute. Till today, I haven't worn that shirt that I wore in that interview. I came back home and I told my wife, I said, I can't take this job. God told me to trust him. I'm going to trust him. It's a beautiful blue shirt. I've not worn it one day because I feel disgusted every time I look at it because I went away from him. I didn't let him break me like he's supposed to break me and to multiply my blessings. I felt like this woman. It's easy for us to skip past this so quickly when God says, I know you're going to die, but I want you to give me everything you got. God, I have nothing. I know you have nothing, but the little that you have, give it to me. And look at what she does. Elijah says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. I hope that I'm talking to a church that's willing to be obedient to the voice of God and not obey your fears. Because the fear is from the enemy. And I hope that no matter who stands against you, no matter who preaches against you, that you would hear the voice of God and obey his voice. Because when you stand before him, it's not going to be the pastor or the evangelist or the TikTok influencer who's going to stand and vouch for what you did and said. It's going to be his word against you and your life. And he's going to say, did you do what I commanded you to do? And this boy might have looked like a fool before the 20,000 people. This woman could have looked like a fool in front of her son and in front of the whole village. But she did what the Lord had commanded her to do. And church, as this year comes to an end, are you ready to do what God has commanded you to do? Not for the sake of the church growth, but for the sake for you to be molded and shaped in the hands of God who's willing to break you and multiply what he's entrusted you with. God takes the overlooked blessing. And then he breaks it, and he multiplies it. And then the disciples, they begin to take the food, and they begin to distribute it. And what do you know? It says in verse 12, and when they'd eaten, they fill. Wow, burps all around. They were satisfied. They're like, this is giving us enough energy to walk back home. 
they'd had their fill. He told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. I'm going to bring this to a close with my last point. The leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Jesus uses the leftovers from the blessing. He uses the leftovers. We saw the overlooked, the broken, and now we come to the leftovers. You're tracking with me. Church, you know what I like about our church? You know what I like about coming here on Sunday mornings? Is that we don't just read a passage that's very familiar to you. But I like how God wants to speak to you so directly so that you can begin to apply these passages that you know from childhood you've known this. America is blessed with God's word. We're blessed with access to God's word. Unlike people where I'm from, I had to save up money for many months to be able to afford a Bible. But you know these passages so well. But I like how God is bringing it into the context of your life this morning. And dear God, I hope that you're not taking you know, this lightly, but you will take this to heart and see that, God, I've overlooked blessings. God, I'm not going to take back the blessings that you're beginning to break, but I'm going to trust that you're going to multiply it. And now God is challenging you as we come to the end of this year to pay attention to the leftovers, pay attention to the fragments, pay attention to the crumbs that are there because he's going to use this to teach you a lesson that's going to help you through the storms of this life. What's going to happen is, and next week I'll preach on this, about how the disciples get in the boat and Jesus stays back. I told you, man, he wants to be alone. He's grieving the death of his cousin. The disciples get in the boat and they begin to go and there's a storm. It's dark. It's late. And the disciples freak out. And we'll talk about this next week, but Jesus walks on the water and they think it's a ghost. But then they recognize his voice. And then it says in the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 51, he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased. See, this was a very unnatural storm. Okay? He gets in the boat. The wind stops. And they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. I told you this morning, we're following the bread. They did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. They did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. Church, I want you to understand about the loaves this morning. I want you to understand about the barley loaves this morning. Because if you don't, you're going to fail every test that comes your way. And every storm that comes your way, you're going to give into fear. But God has not given you a spirit of fear. But a power of love and of a sound mind. And if you don't consider the loaves that's left over in your backpack, you're going to miss this. And as we come to the tail end of this year, God wants you to look back at your overlooked blessing. At the blessings that are broken, that are yet to be multiplied. And the blessings that he's multiplied that you have leftovers of. And he says, have you forgotten? Joel, have you forgotten how I brought you this far? Are you going to be like the people of Israel who are standing there and saying, were there not enough graves in Egypt that we could have been buried over there? Are you going to forget that I didn't bring you up this far to take you, not to take you back again to slavery, but to take you to the promised land? Yes, there will be giants. Yes, there will be storms. But consider the loaves. Consider the loaves. Consider the loaves. Do you remember how it was overlooked? And I took it. Do you remember how it was broken, but it was multiplied? Do you remember I told you to collect the fragments because there was a need for it? Twelve baskets left over. Why twelve baskets? It's like each disciple had his own backpack, so they couldn't blame Judas. And say, well, he was the one with the backpack. You have blessings in your backpack. You have blessings in your bank account. You have blessings in your car. You have blessings in your living room. You have blessings in your bedroom. You have blessings in your relationships that you share. You have blessings. You have fragments left over of God's majestic touches on your life. What are you going to do as this year comes to an end and as you prepare for the next year? Are you going to consider the loaves or are you going to go into the wild, into the ocean, into the deeps, into the dark depths and fear the storms and fail the test that God brings your way because you will fail if you don't consider the loaves. For the disciples, they failed the test, I think. The overlooked blessing was overlooked in the boat. The broken blessing was not remembered and multiplied in their hearts. And they left all the fragments, the leftovers in a corner, in the dark crevices of the boat, just like how the heart was. Church, what are you going to do this morning? It aches my heart. It pains my heart for us as believers to forget the blessings. The old hymn writer says, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. We as a church want to grow in our intimacy with Jesus. How are you going to grow with intimacy with Jesus if you don't look at how intimate he's been with you and blessed you and called you when you were overlooked, anointed you when everybody else forsake you? And he says, now will you count the blessings? Name them one by one. Let me surprise you of what I've done. And as you're grateful, I will multiply your blessings. And as you trust me and I break these areas in your life, you trust me now. You trust me now. Don't be like Ananias and Sapphira that lie to me. Let me break you so I can multiply you. Because he has a purpose for your life. No matter how old, no matter how young you are, you have a calling. 
and he wants to use you. Could it be possible that this new year could be the year where God calls you into something that you never thought you would step into? Could it be that this year God is going to call you into deeper intimacy with him so that you and your intimacy with Christ will compel unbelievers around you to find new hope and life in Jesus Christ? Would you please stand? We'll pray and we'll close. I had a dream last night, like I was preaching my last sermon over here, and I was giving you my farewell speech, and I woke up in a hurry because I said, Lord, no, 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 I'm not ready for that yet. And I remembered that I do want to preach every message like it's my last, because one day that will be true. And I do not know when that message will be my last one, which one it would be, but if this was my last one, I'm glad it was this. And I want you to remember, don't overlook the blessings in your life. Let him break what he has to break, to multiply what he's trusted you with. Give it into his hands. But in the meantime, consider the loaves. I want to give you homework this week. This is what my family and I are going to do every single day of this week. I want us to go around and talk about the blessings of God in our life. I want us to remember what God has blessed us with. I'm not going to call anything small or insignificant because I don't want to overlook the blessing. I don't want any blessing to be underrated. I want to jump for joy and rejoice in my heart at everything that, the God, that God has done, all the blessings that he's given us. This church is a huge blessing to me. The people in this church are a huge blessing to me. From the youngest to the oldest, my children, my family, my friends, there are so many things that we can be thankful for. I know Thanksgiving has come and gone, but a believer should always be thankful. So let's pray. Father, <laughs> as we follow the bread, my king, I cannot afford to finish this message without thanking you for the bread of life, for the bread that was broken. But it wasn't broken to be thrown in the trash, it was broken to be multiplied so that all around the world now, people can find the identity in Jesus. I thank you for the bread that was overlooked and the stone that the builders had rejected had become the cornerstone. I thank you for the bread that was broken, the bread that was overlooked. I thank you for the bread that is now walking in his church, leading his church, putting us to the test, walking us in and out the door of green pastures. I want to thank you for the bread of life that is our good shepherd. I want to thank you for the bread of life that satisfies our every need. I want to thank you for the bread of life that heals our diseases. I want to thank you for the bread of life that forgives me of all my iniquities. I want to thank you for the bread of life that's made available to every person who will come to you. If you're an unbeliever over here, by an unbeliever, I mean you've not put your faith in Jesus. You've, not, you've said yes to ch church. You've said yes to Christianity. You've said yes to a religion. You've said yes to a doctrine. You've said yes to a denomination, but you've not said yes to Jesus. You don't have a relationship with him. I want to invite you this morning. Well, the church is examining their own blessings in their life. I want you to, to have this blessing of new life. I want you to have this blessing of Jesus in your life. And if that's you, you've never given your life to Jesus, you want to do it right now. I just want you to say, Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I want you to forgive me. Jesus, I want you to give me this purpose in life. I do not know where I'm headed. The future looks scary, but I know that you created me for a purpose. And I know that there are a lot of blessings in my life that I'm blind to. Jesus, I need you to open my eyes. Have my life. And if you pray that prayer, man, would you please come and talk to me after church because I just want to give you a big hug and pray for you in person. I want to rejoice with you. It was a huge, beautiful commitment. I remember the day I made this commitment. It's the best decision I ever made. I promise you, you would not be disappointed at all. But Jesus is a faithful friend. He sees you at your worst and he still loves you. He sticks around. Jesus is such a beautiful friend that he knows everything about your past and he knows all your future failures and still he smiles at you and he says, don't worry, I paid it all. And if you're a believer over here, 
I pray that God will fill your heart with joy at what he's already given you. All the blessings that he's blessed you with. Some of you didn't think you were going to make it this year because of sickness. You thought you were going to die. And you don't look at life as a blessing. But please don't let the blessing turn into a curse because of your lack of character. Know that God's put you here on this earth for a reason. Some of you, you didn't want to be here in Boise, Idaho at this point, at this time of the year. You didn't want to be here. But God's kept you here for a reason. Don't overlook the blessing. If he's breaking you, I know it's painful to give everything when you feel like you have nothing. And I pray that God would multiply your joy as you wait. Jesus, I thank you so much for loving your church. Thank you for kissing us with your presence this morning. Thank you, God, for pouring out the oil of gladness on our hearts. Thank you for your word that comes alive every time we come over here. I am blown away, Jesus, at how you speak to your church, how you gentle shepherd encourage your church, how you come and lift us up when we're broken, how you encourage us when we're discouraged. So now as we go back home, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your blessings. Give us now the lenses to be able to see the world through your eyes so we don't just look at barley, bread, but look at it as sufficient to feed the hunger of the people around us. God, I pray that you would give us a special anointing for those that are called to specific areas of ministry. I pray for special wisdom and discernment for those that you're calling to step out in faith, that we would not do it out of a knee-jerk emotional reaction, but we would know without a shadow of a doubt that it's you who's called us and that you will sustain us. God, I pray for those who are acting in just knee-jerk reactions, emotional stirrings, that you would teach us to slow down, that you would teach us to be humble and to go get a job if we need to, and that that's where our ministry should be. And for those of us that should quit our jobs and get into ministry, give us that wisdom, O oh Lord, to discern. And I pray for us as a church as we strive to grow in intimacy with you, that you would answer the, des the desires of our heart, O oh Lord. We thank you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit oh, break you, multiply you. And may all his callings on your life be sufficient for the need that's around you, for your families, for your marriage, for your children, for your jobs and your neighborhoods. May you be the evangelist that God's calling you to be in your circle of influence. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.